All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is the second seminar, computational biology seminar uh, this semester. And uh, my name is Michael Berlinski. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences. And also part of me belongs to the Center of Computation and Technology here at LSU. And um, this is the title of the talk. So I'll be talking a little bit about computational biology and how we can use computational biology to speed up drug discovery. And also there is uh, another component to it, and I will get to this uh, later. So this is the outline for this talk. Uh, <clears throat> the first part will be an actual computational biology. And what I'm going to do is I will walk you through uh, one of the research projects that I work on uh, in drug discovery. And the second thing, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about cutting edge computer technologies and how can we use them in computational biology. And remember that this is not only for computational biology, we can use this in any form of computational science, uh, physics, chemistry, engineering, uh, math, everywhere. But today we'll be focusing on, on uh, computational biology. Uh, so the research project that I'll be talking about uh, focus is, is focusing on the development of novel antibiotics. Okay? And what I want to emphasize right now, that this is not an effort of a single person, but this is a team approach, okay? So there is a larger group of people uh, working on this project. And this whole project was started by Dr. Grover Waldrop. Many of you uh, know him. He's a full professor in biological sciences, and he's shown right here, uh, sharing his ideas with other people. So he started this project. and. Uh, he actually was working with Pfizer on exactly the same project. And then at some point, uh, Pfizer terminated this research despite some really encouraging results because they figured out this research is not profitable enough. So that's why he moved everything uh, to LSU. And he asked uh, other people at LSU to work with him on this project. And he also asked me. So I will give you my side of this story. And other people who are involved, uh, uh, Dr. Taylor from uh, chemistry, he's an uh, organic chemist. We have a microbiologist, uh, Dr. Pettis, Dr. Gilman, uh, bioanalytical chemistry, Molly Silvers, uh, this is the only graduate student working uh, on that, and actually she's doing everything. And uh, myself, and uh, I provide some computational support to this, to this whole project. And if you want to read the whole story, also the uh, story of, of other people, uh, there is an article published in LSU Research uh, Magazine last fall. So this is a link. You can, you can uh, read the whole thing. So <clears throat> what this project is about. This is our drug target. So this is what we want to uh, inhibit. Okay? Uh, this is biotin carboxylase B domain. Uh, this is very important uh, enzyme in, in bacteria because it catalyzes the uh, irreversible and biotin-dependent carboxylation of acetyl coenzyme A to produce malonyl uh, coenzyme A. Okay? And from the biochemistry classes, you probably know that this malonyl coenzyme A is a very important substrate for the biosynthesis of fatty acids. Okay? So this is the first uh, reaction in the biosynthesis of fatty acids. So the idea is if you can inhibit this uh, protein, you will shut down the biosynthesis of fatty acids and the bacteria will die. Okay? Uh, so that's why this is a, a very attractive target for uh, the development of novel antibiotics and this is what uh, we are after. And this is the crystal structure of this enzyme with ATP inside the binding sites or active sites, it's right here. And Pfizer already developed 14 inhibitors to inhibit this binding site. However, uh, there is some echo here. Uh, however, no of those inhibitors are perfect and those are not real drugs, so uh, there is still lots of work uh, to do and this is what we'll be doing. So these are just some examples of those inhibitors developed by Pfizer. Uh, there are 14 of them. I just show five here. And specifically, you will be focusing on this scaffold, which is aminooxazole. 
it shows uh, right here. So this is amino oxazole scaffold. And there are two compounds developed by Pfizer. Uh, as you can see, they have different moieties attached to the side groups R1 and R2, okay? So we'll be trying to modify those groups to get a better drug. Uh, that should work. Okay. Uh, so what's the problem? Because they already have those compounds, okay? So the problem is that from your microbiology class, uh, you probably know that bacteria could be either uh, gram positive or gram negative, right? So all those compounds that were developed by Pfizer, they were potent, but only against gram negative. And here are some examples, uh, E. coli and some, some other gram negative bacteria. So none of these inhibitors uh, is potent against both gram negative and gram positive, okay? And that creates a problem because if you want to develop a, a new antibiotic, it should be broad spectrum, okay? so it should kill everything, basically. And there are some differences within active sites uh, on, between different isoforms of this enzyme. Okay? The differences are shown here. So you have different residue positions, and then you have different residues. So for example, this is an interesting one. Uh, where is this thing? Oh, yeah. uh, 437, right? Isoleucin in gram negative, and then you have threonine in, in gram positive. So there are some differences. And those differences actually uh, make those compounds inactive towards gram, uh, gram positive. So we'll try to fix this and come up with a drug that is a broad spectrum that will kill all those bacterial species listed here. So uh, we'll start from, from some sort of molecular modeling or computational biology, and this is my part, so this is what I'll be talking about. And uh, we'll be using something which is called virtual screening. Okay, so uh, in a real lab, you can do real experimental screening, which is very expensive, but here we can do virtual screening. And this is how it works. It's, it's very simple. You have your target protein, which we already have. Then you need some drug candidates that you want to test. You need also a computer, and this is the center part. Using this computer, you do some sort of molecular docking. So you will take all those compounds, and then you'll try to dock to uh, your target protein. And you'll see how well those compounds fit inside the active site of your protein, right? If you find something that fits really well, like this guy over here, then you can take this experimentally, okay? And that will speed up everything and it will dramatically reduce the cost, right? Because you don't have to make all the experiments for all those compounds, just select uh, very few of them. Uh, so you dramatically reduce the cost of, of uh, an experimental screening by using computations. And this is actually how, how the simulations uh, look like uh, you have your protein, that's actually a different protein, but it doesn't matter, the methodology is exactly the same. And then you have to, your compound, which is drug candidate, and you just try to feed this into active site, right? And what the software uh, does, it also calculates this energy of interaction and try to find the uh, <coughs> optimum binding pulse with the lowest energy. Uh, and then if the energy is low enough, it will tell you that, oh, this is a good drug candidate, uh, you should test this experimentally. So the project looks uh, really, really straightforward, and I was very happy to work on that. All the tools are there, and just you know, run this in your computer, and everything will be fine. So that was my initial plan that uh, I, was, I was very excited about. So first, I thought that you know, I'll just obtain a library of those amino oxazole uh, compounds from commercial uh, libraries or for organic compounds. That sounded really straightforward. Then I'll just dock those compounds to our enzymes. We have several uh, biotin carboxylase isoforms, so just you know, dock, dock to all of them. Estimate this binding affinity, and then pick up those with a uh, really high binding affinity, or high potency, ship them down to experiments, and the project is done. Right? So I thought that you know it can be done a couple of weeks. Uh, it looks really, really easy. So I started working on that. So first, <clears throat> um, I was trying to obtain, obtain this library of amino oxazole derivatives, okay? And I downloaded a huge library of this number, 50 million commercially available organic compounds. This is a free library that you can download if you want. Uh, and I was looking specifically uh, for compounds 
that have this amino oxazole uh, moiety. Okay, so uh, I did this. So just to remind you, this is uh, our prototype drug, this amino oxazole, and I was screening this drug through this huge library of 15 million. That's a, that's a really significant number. Uh, organic compounds, and I thought that you know, it looks like some common organic uh, moiety, right? So it must be there. So this whole search, it took maybe an hour. It was a fast algorithm. Uh, so do you know how many compounds did I get from that search? Any ideas? Yeah, that was actually very disappointing because I got three, okay, out of 15 million. Uh, this is some sort of chemical similarity between my scaffold and uh, those compounds. And there are three, and actually you cannot do anything about them, right? I mean, they are much smaller, they don't have those side groups. And this is not even amino oxazole, right? You have a, a carboxy group somewhere uh, here, and then you have amide here, right? So it's not the same thing. So that was very disappointing, and then I thought that, oh, well, I will worry about this later, right? So let's move on, and then I will go back and figure this out. So I went to the next step, despite this failure, and I was trying to dock those compounds into those biotin carboxylase isoforms, okay? And <clears throat> before you run calculations like that, you have to make sure that the software or the algorithm that you are using is going to work on your system, right? So what I did, I took those 14 Pfizer inhibitors and I docked them using existing software and I measure uh, the performance of the software, right? How, how good the software is, because uh, if the software will give you experimental binding pose, it means that it's great and you just move on, right? So those are docking benchmarks. So in docking benchmarks, you know the answer, but you pretend that you don't. You run your calculations and then you see how well this, this software does. So this is what I did pretty much. And those are the results. So you have some IDs of those uh, 14 Pfizer compounds in this column. And this is the accuracy that I got from existing and pretty much state-of-the-art docking software uh, in this code, okay? And those numbers represent RMSD in angstrom from experimental binding pose. And RMSD stands from root mean square deviation. So this is some sort of a measure for deviation from a correct answer, okay? So if there is no deviation, you, uh, your algorithm is perfect, you will get zero. And in general, the lower number is better. And people typically assume that if it's below two, it's good. If it's above two, it's, it's really bad, okay? So those numbers that are highlighted in green are below two angstrom. So those are really, really good predictions. However, if you count them, they're only four out of 14, right? So the conclusion is that you cannot really use the software because the results would be miserable. Uh, most of them would be incorrect. So. Then I was really getting disappointed because there is no library of those compounds. This docking software doesn't work. So I was really close to just give up. Uh, but instead of that, I had to modify my plan, right? So I went back and that was my original plan. So I did some modifications. Instead of obtaining library, uh, now we'll be constructing the library. So we have to build this from scratch, unfortunately. Uh, then we need to develop more accurate docking approach because we cannot use existing software for this system. And once we have this more accurate docking approach, we can dock those compounds, estimate binding affinity, and ship uh, predictions to experimental testing. So that's, that's the modified uh, plan of action for, for this research. So uh, those two steps are complete. The rest are close to be complete. So. Uh, this is how you can build actually those compounds, any library you, you want. So I downloaded 9,400 of organic building blocks, which are just some examples are shown here, right? Those are all aromatic moieties, but it could be anything. It's just a small organic uh, chunk. Uh, we know our prototype molecule, right? So you just take two of these and you attach them uh, to group, group R1 and R2. And this is how you can build those different uh, organic compounds. Uh, so I did this. Uh, I explored all possible combinations. This is just some combinatorial chemistry, right? And I got 127 million of different compounds. So 
that's that's quite a lot, right? And now we cannot really test all of them. We cannot even simulate all of them. So then I decided to go only with uh, a fraction of those compounds. Uh, so I decided to test about nine million of those compounds against every uh, PC isophore. But at least the library was was uh, was was created, and uh, those are some examples of those compounds that, that you can build using uh, computational tools. Uh, in those yellow circles, you have uh, amino oxazole scaffold, right? So you can see that all those scaffolds, uh, they look the same. They have just different stuff attached to uh, in those positions, right? All those compounds are different. So we can generate 127 million of those guys, but actually we'll be working with uh, this number, which is still a lot. So now for docking, um, we don't really need full docking because we can make the assumption that this amino oxazole moiety it will bind in the same spot, right? So we can what we can do we can develop some sort of similarity based docking, uh, and this is how it works. It's very uh, straightforward. So you have a compound that you want to dock to this protein, right? This big protein. And this protein happens to be already co-crystallized with one amino oxazole inhibitor, which is sitting right here, right? So you take any of those nine million compounds and you place it in this binding site uh, in such a way that this amino oxazole moiety overlaps with this one. And then you just optimize the position of the side chain, right? And that simplifies everything. And the accuracy should be higher and the computation should uh, run much, much faster. The only problem was, uh, from the algorithm point of view, how to place this automatically. Because uh, for us, as, as humans, it's really easy. You just see this moiety here, you find the similar chunk, and you just put it there, right? But if you go, for example, uh, by atom types, you have several oxygens here and nitrogens. So uh, for the algorithm, it's, it's really difficult to, to do this. And this is also known as a uh, NP-hat problem. But there are some algorithms that uh, you can use, and one is um, uh, graph-based chemical matching. It will just match equivalent atoms for you. This is a really, really fast algorithm that, that you can use. So that's really, really straightforward. Uh, you can actually do the similarity-based docking for, for this project and for, uh, for any other system, actually. And uh, since we've been developing this, um, I just thought that, you know, instead of uh, developing an algorithm that will work only for one protein, you can build something that is more general. So you can use this uh, for any other systems, right? For any other uh, drug discovery projects. So that's why we try to do this in a more general way. So this algorithm can be reused for, for some, some other projects. Uh, so that's why I was running some more extensive testing uh, of, this, of this algorithm. Uh, and specifically, we're interested in uh, the prediction of binding pose. So how well you can reproduce the experimental binding pose uh, of compounds. So that's the first question. And the second question was, if you can get the binding affinity right. Okay, that's, that's even a uh, more difficult question. So uh, for each of these questions, we have separate data set to work on. And uh, we try to make this data set as as large as, as possible, right? So we try to cover as much as, as possible. So those are uh, representative benchmarks. Uh, so the first data set uh, was done on 280 pharmacologically relevant protein drug complexes from this Aztec uh, CCDC data set. And the second one was done on 1400 complexes from binding database. So for every complex from this data set, there is experimentally measured binding affinity. So you can try to predict this or estimate this using computations and then see how well you do with respect to experimentally measured uh, binding affinity. And there is lots of things that you, you have to calc calculate uh, to make sure that the, your algorithm uh, works as it was designed to work. Uh, so you worry about the binding post prediction, you worry about binding affinity prediction. Uh, you also need to account for sensitivity to structural distortions in proteins, because you know when uh, small molecules bind to proteins, 
there is some rearrangement of side chains and things like that, so the conformation might be a little bit different, and that will affect uh, all the results, so that may affect binding post prediction and uh, the estimation of binding affinity as well. So we have to worry about those things too. And uh, specifically, in, in, in our case, we also have something that we call this anchor substructure, which is amino oxal, right? So how, your, how, uh, how big your anchor should be to get a decent accuracy, and you know, all those, those questions. And uh, I'm not going to go over uh, all the results here, because that would just take forever, but uh, I will just show you a couple of plots one for this binding point post prediction and one for uh, the actual virtual screen. Okay, so that will give you some idea how well the software works in a real virtual screening scenario. Uh, so this is just some result and uh, don't worry about those inset plots <clears throat> for the prediction of, of binding pulse. Okay, so we already talked that uh, you can measure this by RMSD, right? So now you don't have one protein, but you have uh, 280 and for everyone, you can measure this RMSD, the deviation from experimental uh, structure, and you can plot it here, right? And this line, it shows you two angstroms, so everything that is below this line is good. And then depending how you run those calculations, you can get accuracy from 60 to 80 percent. So this is something pretty, pretty decent. And then in some cases, about this line, your algorithm fails. And it can fail because of only two reasons. Uh, and those are failures here. You can actually show them as those RMSD spectrum plots. I will, I will tell you how to read those plots. So green is uh, su uh, success. So something was docked within this threshold shown here. And then for failure, you can have even either, either sampling failure. So it means that, that you didn't sample enough. You remember this, this movie with this compound just moving around? So that's sampling. So if you don't sample enough, you don't get the right answer, and that's a sampling failure. Or you can, your sampling is just fine, but you have a problem with your scoring function. So you cannot really uh, score those interactions well. So those are two different types of, of failures. And it looks like in our case, uh, mostly it's, it's green, so it's good in most of the cases. There are some scoring failures, a little bit here, but it's not that bad. But there is uh, much more those sampling failures, right? And that's some useful information because now we know what, what to fix. So we just need to increase the sampling. Uh, and the, the second plot, and that's, that's the last plot uh, uh, for this part, is the enrichment in virtual screening, because this is actually what we want to get, right? You have your large library of compounds, you want to rank them, and this is virtual screening, and you want the top fraction, very small top fraction of this library, to be significantly enriched with bioactive molecules, okay? Uh, that's virtual screening. And you can measure this using several different uh, values. So I think that the most commonly used is this enrichment factor. Don't worry about all those numbers. Uh, those are some, some individual scoring functions and, and different software. But our software is, is right here. Okay? So for example, enrichment factor for this 1%, it means how many bioactive compounds you get in the top 1% of the library. It's very, very tiny, right? So if you run this software, you get around one quarter. So a quarter of those bioactive compounds will be sitting in the top 1%. So the enrichment is like 25, right? So that's something very high. So it means that, in principle, we should be able to use this in some real virtual screening, like in our uh, case, to get good antibiotics. So um, I finished all those, those benchmarks, and then I went back to our system. Uh, and again, those are those results for 14 Pfizer compounds, right? So I already showed you this middle column, so this is for existing software, and this is what I got uh, uh, using our software. So now you can see that it's uh, much better, right? It's twice as good. So instead of four good hits, uh, I think we, we got like eight. So uh, it should work for the majority of the cases for this system, right? So that's something uh, encouraging. And Actually, we are uh, pretty confident using this software uh, <clears throat> in, this, in this project. And then the, the last thing that I check is that uh, if we can the uh, binding affinity right. And since this is an enzyme, we will try to predict IC50. And from uh, biochem class, 
you know that IC50 is a half maximum inhibitor concentration of a drug uh, that inhibits an enzyme. So the lower the better. But what we are concerned about is the correlation between real experimental IC50, which can be measured experimentally uh, with the values that we predict. Okay, so we want to see a high correlation because then you have those 9 million compounds. You can calculate those IC50 and if there is a good correlation with experimental values, then you don't have to do 9 million experiments, right? And that saves you lots of time and money. And actually for this system, the correlation is, is, is uh, pretty decent, right? So whatever we predict here, it uh, agrees very well with experimental values. So we don't have to do uh, that many experiments anymore. So now let's review uh, what we have in this project. Uh, and this is pretty much where, where, where I stopped, uh, but I want to show you what, what else uh, uh, we are working on right now. So we have 9 million those drug candidates that you want to dog against seven isoform of this enzyme from different bacterial species, right? And we are covering uh, gram-negative as well as gram-positive. So if you take this 9 million almost and times seven, then you will come up with this number, 62 million compounds or structures to model, right? It's, it's quite a lot. And I, I was getting very concerned about this, but uh, it's, on the other hand, it's a very impressive number because nobody can do this. So then the question is, can we do this, right? So um, then we can do simple calculation. So let's assume that one docking simulation will take around five minutes. And this is a little bit overestimated, but it also includes some postdoc refinement steps and all that stuff. So actually, that, uh, this is pretty decent number. Okay, so it takes five minutes for one docking simulation. So you take this five, multiply it by 62 million, then divide by 60, and divide by 24, and divide by 365 days. And uh, if you get it right, you will see that you need around 60 years using one processor uh, to finish this project. So uh, that's not very encouraging, and uh, I don't have 60 years to do this. So we need something that is much, much faster, right? So what is faster than one processor? Obviously, many processors, right? Or one supercomputer. So if you flip those numbers, you can say that you'll get the results in one year if you have 600 processors, right? And that's something that looks much, much better. And uh, in general, I'm, I'm a patient person, but still, I don't want to wait one year, right? So uh, one supercomputer, supercomputer is, is not enough to finish this. So we need something that is faster than a supercomputer. And right now, let me uh, step away from, from this project just, just for a little. And let's talk about what is faster than a supercomputer? Super so what are the cutting edge computer technologies out there that you can use in computational biology? Uh, can you think about one? There is lots of those technologies and obviously we'll not be talking about all of them, but just one. Games, video games, right? That's a cutting edge technology. And actually I found this picture. This is a uh, Magnavox Odyssey. That's the first video game console, yes, sir. Kind of. Um, that's the first video game console that was released in the early 70s, right? Um, it was a cutting edge technology 40 years ago. Uh, not anymore, probably. So most of you uh, wouldn't play something like that. I wouldn't uh, either. But uh, in May this year, 2013, uh, Microsoft released Xbox One, right? So that, that's cutting edge technology right now. And just for information, this, this little box, which is a video game console, it has a uh, peak performance of about 1.2 teraflops, okay? And one teraflop is one point, uh, floating point operation uh, per second. So if you add two numbers, that's one flop. If you add two numbers and multiply this by number, that's two flops and so on. So uh, this hardware can process as many as 1.2 teraflops per second. 
that's something really, really powerful. So uh, let's think about this. Why we have this hard work right now? Uh, why people spend so much time and money in the development of, of this hard work? Yeah, well, the answer is that we like play games, right? And uh, again, going back to this early 70s, this is a uh, picture that I found. I'm sorry, I cannot see the slide. It's frozen. Did something happen? Can you do anything? Something is hanging. Can you quit? Thanks. All right, so uh, people I like playing video games, so that's why we have this hardware right now. And I found this picture uh, on the internet, so two people sitting and playing this Magnavox Odyssey in early 70s. And to me, it looks like Tenny. I'm, I'm not really sure what this game is, but it definitely looks like Tenny. Yeah, so that's a ball and two players just bouncing the ball, right? So they look happy, but uh, I suspect that this is some sort of a commercial picture, so they're supposed to be happy. But what this guy is really thinking is that, what the hell, this is a square tennis ball, right? I mean, he's probably very disappointed playing this, and I'm sure that you would be disappointed as well. So this is not what we want, right? So we want to play something that is more realistic than a square tennis ball. So... Uh, how many of you would, you, uh, would would like to play something like that? Nobody. But right now we have something more like this one, right? So let me repeat the question. How, how many of you uh, wouldn't mind playing this or have some experience playing this? All right, that's much better. Okay, so uh, this desire to play video games, it actually stimulated the uh, development of hardware uh, that can be used to play those games, right? So Xbox One, Xbox 360, all those video games consoles, they were developed for, for people who play games, for us. So uh, we can actually uh, take a look what's the change in this hardware and why this hardware is so fast and why you can play those games right now. Uh, I was actually thinking about bringing my Xbox here and trying to uh, look inside, but then I thought that it's probably not a, a good idea. But I don't want to download some pictures so we can see uh, what's inside anyway. So this is just Xbox 360, right? We can open it up and see what's inside. So this is what you will see. Uh, some capacitors and two big uh, radiators. So we take them, we can take them off. And under those radiators, you will find two chips, right? This is one chip and this is another chip. And uh, many of you already probably know that one of those chips, this one, is a CPU chip. This is just a regular processor that you have in your laptops or in your desktop. This one actually has uh, three cores. In most of your laptops right now, you have four cores, right? It's quad core. And then you have another chip, which is called GPU. And this is the graphics processing unit, okay? So this processor was specifically developed to uh, process all this huge amount of graphics that you need to process when you play a game. And actually, this split, because uh, before, all the computations were done on only CPU. But around 10 years ago, uh, people figured out that, you know, let's just separate them and let's develop a very powerful graphics processor for video games consoles so we can play better games. So that's why they came up with this GPU, that's a graphics uh, processor. And we can actually see that those uh, GPU units are much, much faster than CPUs. And this is, again, some... 
uh, images that I downloaded from the internet. So here you have a timeline going back from 1970s. We are right somewhere here. And the blue, blue line is the speed of a CPU, just a regular processor that you have in your laptop. Now, somewhere around 10 years ago, uh, people started working on those GPUs to make computer games like this one uh, look much, much better and providing better gaming experience. So you have this line over here. And this, this is, by the way, this, the speed in flop, right? So the higher, the better. So you can see clearly from, from this plot that GPUs are much, much faster currently than uh, regular processors. And this is another plot very similar that compares, uh, you cannot probably read this very well, Intel CPUs that you have in your, in your laptops with NVIDIA cards, right? So probably many of you have uh, GeForce cards in your, in your desktops. So this is a series of uh, GeForce cards going back from uh, uh, 2003. So those first graphics cards were very compatible uh, in a peak performance to CPUs, but then they just took off. And right now, they're much, much, much more powerful, right? So the development of this hardware was stimulated only from the video game industry, right? From our desire to play better games. Uh, and I do play games from time to time, but uh, not only. So what I really want to ask is that can we use this technology for scientific computing, right? For example, drug discovery. We've been talking about this drug, this drug discovery. And then there was the problem that the calculations are so expensive that we cannot really process them. So perhaps we can use this technology designed for video game industry to speed up drug discovery. And the short answer is yes, we can and we should. So now, how we can do this? Uh, we can do this this way. And this is also what I found. So some kids, they build uh, high performance computing clusters just using uh, video game consoles, right? So you have a PC and then I believe there are eight uh, Sony PlayStation here linked together. And that doesn't look like math, but this is a very high performance computing cluster. Someone else did the same thing with Xbox 360, except for this PC. You have six video game consoles here. And again, this is a pretty powerful machine. Uh, that doesn't look very professional. Um, so I also found this. This is a Warhol cluster, which is made entirely of uh, Sony PlayStation 3. There are 75 of them in those racks. And it's a very power, powerful machine, right? It has lots of uh, peak performance and it's built up entirely of PS3. Uh, however, again, uh, it doesn't look very professional and you actually don't have to use uh, the video game consoles themselves to build a machine like that because most of those technologies developed for uh, video games, you can also find on uh, cheap graphics cards for your PC. And this is an example. Uh, if someone plays a video game on your desktop, this is uh, what I'm guessing that, that you have, right? This is a regular PC, which is equipped with uh, powerful graphics card. Uh, in this case, this is uh, GeForce uh, 8800 GTX. So actually this graphic card, which is shown over here, is much, much more powerful than this whole PC, right? And it's easily accessible. So uh, you can play games on that, or you can use this for uh, number crunching. You can run simulations like Discovery on that stuff. And actually, if you are uh, interested, you can put more of those graphic cards in your PC. I found those with like three, right? And now the speed of the processor, which uh, is sitting here, is just irrelevant because those three graphics cards, they provide so much performance that the speed of the CPU is just uh, negligible. Uh, so you have a three GPU version. And you can actually build something like that really cheap. I think the cost of the graphic card is between three, four hundred dollars. You can get this on Amazon really, really cheap. And you can build uh, high performance machines like that, uh, uh, which are sitting on your desk. So now the question is, can we use this for this drug discovery, right? So I'll be going back to our uh, drug discovery uh, project. And I will show you that we can actually run this on those graphic cards. And I've been working with uh, 
people from, from uh, the Department of Computer Science and Physics uh, at CCT uh, with faculty and, and, and students. And uh, over the past semester, we developed a fully functional code for ligand docking that is running on those graphics, uh, uh, graphical processors. And now it's called GPU dot, right? So this is still ligand docking, but all the computations are done uh, using GPUs, not CPUs. And uh, we're benchmarking the performance of this code to see how much faster it runs using graphics processors instead of, of CPUs. And this is pretty much what we've been using. Uh, relatively cheap graphics card, which you can get for $300, uh, GTX uh, 580. And we'll be comparing the speed versus just Intel Core i7. Right? So this is a standard state-of-the-art Intel processor right now. Uh, so, so this is the performance. We are measuring the speed. So the higher is the better. right? So that tells you how much calculations you can do in a second. So the higher, the better. So first, we measure how, how, much, how many calculations we can do using a simple uh, single CPU thread, right? So not that much. I think it's like around 1,000. But this Intel uh, i7, it has many threads, right? So you can run uh, using all the threads. And that should be the second one. Yep, it's right here. So it runs like six times faster because you have six threads instead of one. Uh, so then we ran this on this cheap video card, and we got this performance. Okay, so this is entirely GPU. The whole code for ligand docking is running on the uh, graphics processor. And now the performance is much, much higher. So it's around 50 times faster than one CPU, and over eight times faster than six uh, CPU cores. So now if you have this graphics card, and you move to the other configuration with three of them, right? you pack three graphics cards, so this plot will end oh, probably somewhere here, right? So we have something that runs really, really, really fast. So now we can go back to our uh, biotin carboxylase uh, project, and we can ask the question, so if we can do this now, right? And the answer is yes, and we are actually uh, doing this right now. So this whole project will be actually uh, completed this modeling of 62 million of, of structures using GPUs, right? So our estimate is that using 600 processors, it would take one year. So now if you have 600 GPUs, it will run 50 times faster. So we will be done in a week, okay? That makes a huge, huge difference. So now there's another question. It's, it's all very nice, but do we have those GPUs that we can use? Right? Because, uh, you know, something runs really, really fast, but you don't have the hardware, so that you cannot really use it. But the answer is, yes, we do have those GPUs here at LSU. It's, it's not a problem. And those are some of the systems that are already here physically, or some that uh, are coming to LSU. Uh, this is the largest cluster that we have like right now. It's uh, 440 compute nodes. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very powerful system. The peak performance is 146 teraflops. And the interesting thing is that 50 of those nodes, they're already equipped with NVIDIA graphics card. So we can just use this for, for the docking project. There is another smaller cluster, 24 nodes, uh, which is entirely based on GPU. And this is the uh, next generation of, of graphic cards. This is called Kepler. And there is another system that is coming to us. It has different accelerators, also including uh, NVIDIA Kepler card. So those are graphics processors. So right now, we have everything. We have a uh, very good scientific project. We have all the codes that are running on GPUs. And we have hardware. So I think we'll be done in a week. Um, so probably next time, I, I, I will tell you if we have a drag or not. All right. So. Uh, if any one of you is interested in, in GPU computing, there is a GPU computing group at LSU. Okay? So right now we have around 30 uh, faculty, postdocs, and students from physics, chemistry, biological sciences, uh, computer el uh, and electrical engineering. So we meet once a week. Uh, those meetings are open to everybody. So if you are interested in this form of computing, uh, please feel free to join us. Uh, it's in the new CCT building, BMC, Digital Media Center. 
It's five minutes walk from here. And uh, by the way, this is the architecture of this GPU, but we are not talking about this. It's just pure science and research. So if you are interested, uh, this is a link. You can just click, find us, and you can join us. Um, all right. All right, so um, I will be pitching up right now and uh, acknowledgement to some people that I work with. So this is the antibiotic group, uh, mostly from biology and, and chemistry. There is another big group of people who uh, use GPU in their research. So I work with, with uh, all of them on the development of those new docking codes that run on, on GPUs. And there are some, also some other projects that I didn't talk about. Uh, maybe next time. One is structured by informatics, and I work on that mostly with people from computer science. And there is also some exciting cloud computing. And I'm also uh, grateful for support to several different institutions, and uh, uh, resources are provided by LSU, LONI, which is Louisiana Optical uh, Network Initiative, and also XC, which is funded by NSF. And uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to uh, take any questions. If you want to ask the question, please use mic. Okay, you said if you use the regular process, it would have taken you a year, but how long did this whole process here taking you with developing the software and all of that? Oh, that's probably it's going to be around a year. So, you know, uh, you have two choices, right? Uh, just start running those calculations and then do nothing for a year and get the results, right? Or just you know, go somewhere traveling. Or you can start developing and keep yourself busy writing new calls and then get the results done in a week. And uh, you'll get the results in the year as well, right? But the first version that you are not working on anything, you're just enjoying your life, and the other that you have to actually do work. So uh, uh, I'll go with the, uh, the, the, the latter one. Um, the code that you develop, the GPU code, is it specific to this project or can it be applied to any other? Can be applied to any system you have. So, so, so that's why I was uh, testing this on this 280 pharmacologically relevant system. Uh, so now, now I know this overall performance of this, this software uh, across many different systems, right? So this is a general methodology that, that you can use. And actually, we also have online version for someone who just wants to try this out. Uh, you can go to our website. There is a web form. You can upload your file, you know, protein in some ligands, and it will just run the calculations for you. So you don't have to even download it. Anyone else? No questions. Or you can go ahead and ask him to type it. He'll hear. It. Okay. He can hear you. Brad, if you have any questions, please type. We cannot see them, right? Can we? No, they're not sending them. <laughs> All right. Thank you.